Good evening. I just realized we haven't set our clocks ahead yet. I was like, am I early or am I late? But welcome to our uh, Wednesday evening Lenten services. I want to again thank uh, Rose and Elmer for filling in for me while I was enjoying the uh, warm, wet weather of uh, Daytona Beach last week. Um, I really look forward to uh, sharing a lot of what I learned, um, but that's kind of step two. This is what we're doing tonight is, is step one, and uh, I've really found that uh, um, what we're talking about during these six weeks of Lent it is really a good um, foundation uh, for what we'll be talking about uh, later in the year, uh, leading up to what I hope to do at the Holy Fair this year. But as we begin tonight, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for what he has done for us. And Lord, during this season of Lent where we uh, consider the, the trials and the suffering of Christ on our behalf, uh, Father, would you help us uh, by your Spirit uh, to examine our own lives in the light of the cross of Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship tonight comes from Psalm 133, which is also what our uh, opening hymn is based off of. It's a song of ascents that David wrote. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded blessing, life forevermore. I'd ask you to stand. I'm going to ask uh, Rose and Julia to come up and help us. Um, this will probably be a new song for a lot of you. We're going to sing the um, first verse and chorus, and then we're going to repeat it uh, so that you can uh, join in. But join in as you would, if, you'll, if you would stand as you're able.
that's not where I want to go with that. So tonight we're looking at uh, chapters three and four of Don't Sing Songs to a Heavy Heart. Again, if you, uh, if you haven't picked up one of these on the back table on this side, uh, there's, there's a couple of copies left. Feel free to pick up uh, one of these to take home and, and read through. Um, I think you'll find it uh, helpful if you haven't uh, taken a look at it. Uh, chapters 1 and 2, 3 and 4 are still kind of at the high level, uh, you know, what we call the 30,000 foot view of what does it mean to, to relate to those who are suffering. Next week, when we get into chapters 5 and 6, uh, we start getting more into the, the nitty gritty of things uh, to say and not to say, things to do and not to do. Um, but tonight as we start, we talk about when we're offering care and comfort to someone, we need to recognize that we're stepping into a holy place. Right? And again, you know, last week when we were uh, talking with people about their tattoos, we understand that that's a sacred space that we are stepping into. And I tell people all the time, don't ask somebody about their tattoo unless you're willing to enter into that sacred space with them. Because the, the, the minute that you do it in kind of a flippant manner, it's, it's going to beat you over the head. Um, and, and it will catch you off guard. And uh, the same thing when we're um, talking to... Um, Watch has started telling me funny things. Um, when we're walking into a, the house that, that someone is suffering into, into their lives, it's someone else's house of pain. But Jesus is already there. Right? And that's a key thing for us to remember. Okay? You wouldn't go to, to somebody's home, right, and then, you know, start going into rooms where the doors are closed, right? There's a reason why those doors are closed, because obviously the person doesn't want you to go in there. That's generally right. Those are the rooms where we throw all of our junk before company arrives, right? We do it too. It's okay, right? Because right? we don't want people seeing our junk. We don't want them, you know, evaluating us based on our messiness. There are rooms in our hearts that are messy. And we don't want just anybody wandering in there. Unless we invite them in. We, um, we don't go to somebody's house and say, you know, I really don't like those curtains. I would, I would much prefer blue curtains in your house. Would you change those for me? Right? We don't, we, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't dream of doing that. Okay? We don't come into someone's hurt and pain and say, you know, I would feel a whole lot better if you would just get over this quickly. It would make me feel a lot better, so could you accommodate me? Right? We, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to do that, but sometimes that's how things come across. Each hurting person is unique. They're an individual. And if they invite you in to share in that pain, they are offering you entry into their most private spaces. And that room is furnished with a lot of pain. So as a caregiver, we don't want to try to manipulate how that person is handling the situation to suit ourselves. You know, if it was just me, this is what I would do. And most people look at you and say, that's nice, but I'm not you. What we're trying to do is to lovingly perceive the depths of their suffering and to understand and appreciate the uniqueness of the person 
who's in front of us. One of the things that I, I noticed, and I kind of mentioned this on Sunday, is you know, when I got back on Friday, I was wiped out, tired. I didn't, didn't do much other than you know, kind of sleep and you know, the bare minimum human interaction that I had to have. And then Saturday, I came up here to, to prepare for Sunday. And I kept saying, okay, God, what was the purpose? Why did I do this? Why did I enter that? And then I started reading the text for last Sunday's sermon, Exodus chapter 6, and I was just struck by uh, verse 5 when he says, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel in Egypt. And it's as if God said to me, David, did you hear the groanings? Because I've heard the groanings. And I want you to hear the groanings of the people. And every story that we heard was unique. Everybody has different histories that affect how they handle life's events. And sometimes it comes out on the skin. You know, some of you are, uh, you know, if you're good Yankees fans like you should be, uh, would know who Lou Gehrig is. And most people know him today because uh, there's a disease named after him. We call it Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Um, Lou Gehrig was, you know, one of the Yankee greats. You know, he batted after Babe Ruth, right? <laughs> you know, it was like, if you, if you don't want to pitch to Babe Ruth, you've got to pitch to Lou Gehrig. And the two of them just were monsters at the plate. He played in over 2,000 consecutive games until he was diagnosed with this dreaded, dreadful disease. And they had, uh, you've probably seen you know, some of the video, you probably heard the speech that he gave, I think it was on July 4th, um, when they honored him and you know, he, he realized he couldn't play anymore. And at the end of his speech, he said, you know, he said, you may have heard about this bad break that I've got, but today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. It's pretty impressive for a guy who's been diagnosed with, you know, a life-threatening and very debilitating illness. The danger we would have, you know, you might meet somebody who's, so I've been just diagnosed with, you know, ALS, and people say, well, look at Lou Gehrig, right? Look at how well he handled it. <laughs> Please don't ever say that, right? It can be enticing to point to, well, you know, hey, look at how, well, you know, these well-known people have, have gone through the same thing that you're going through. But you know, all we saw was you know, Lou Gehrig for a couple of minutes talking into a microphone with you know, tens of thousands of people gathered around. We don't know what he was really feeling on the, on the inside. So we, we want to be careful not to point to, well, this is how so-and-so went through it. It worked for them. Again, each person is unique. Because our life experiences, which they're all different, will affect how we respond to different crises. Okay? People with the same illness will respond in different ways. Okay? It may be influenced by how we were brought up. It may be influenced by our faith or lack of faith. We need to be able to look outside our own preconceptions of, of how someone we think someone should handle things, how we think they should respond to things, to focus on what the person in front of us is actually feeling. So our fo it's always, we're always other-focused. Again, that's why I said if you do a tattoo interview and you're thinking about yourself, 
you're going to get blindsided by something that you're not expecting. Because things that look, you know, innocuous oftentimes have a really deep meaning to them. Pain and suffering may also be experienced more or less difficult depending on the nature of the event or the crisis that caused it. Um, There was a movie that came out back in the 90s based on the life of C.S. Lewis called Shadowlands. Uh, It starred Anthony Hopkins and... Uh, I'm forgetting the, the name of the lady who was in it. It was a great movie. It's, it's mostly true. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a, a confirmed bachelor in England. He lived with his, his brother, and uh, he was a, a professor at, at Oxford, and his life was very neat and orderly. And he had uh, done some communication, some correspondence with a woman in uh, the United States. I think she was from New Jersey. Her name was Joy Gresham. And uh, so one day, she and her son popped in for a visit in England. And she wanted to be able to stay in England, but she couldn't because she wasn't a British citizen. Her visa wouldn't allow for that. Uh, So as she got to know C.S. Lewis, she um, worked up the courage to ask him if he would marry her legally so that she could stay in the country. Not you know, out of any romantic interest, but just a legal thing. So he was just extending his citizenship to her. Well, the problem is, over time, they actually did fall in love. And then she came down with cancer. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed wanting God to heal her, and he couldn't understand why God was not answering his prayers. And there's this brilliant part in the movie um, where he's, he's kind of wrestling with this, and he comes to a realization. He says, I don't pray to change God's mind. I pray so that he'll change mine. That took him a long time to get there. Everybody you know, kind of goes through those same kind of things when we're dealing with grief. The severity of events will influ- influence and determine generally how long it takes somebody to quote-unquote get over something. Okay. So the level of difficulty increases uh, if the event is life-shortening, if it is of longer duration, if it leads to no recovery or only partial recovery, if it involves great pain, physical or otherwise, if it's something that produces multiple crises simultaneously, if it's something that will require significant lifestyle changes, or if it comes as a complete shock, those things typically will make matters worse. It will make it harder for somebody to get through that deep suffering that comes with the event. So remember, each individual's experience is different and can't be compared to anyone else. And we don't want to minimize a person's suffering just because it doesn't include anything on that list. It might have none of those actual effects, but it still may be something that is deeply problematic. If there's multiple things on that list happening, then you can expect the suffering to be greater. So what's available to the person going through the suffering? Okay. the resources that they have readily available can also affect their ability to cope. Do they have adequate finances? Do they have adequate health insurance? Do they have support from family and friends? Do they have the support of a pastor? 
Do they have people that they can talk honestly and openly with? Support from their faith community? Assistance in just getting through day-to-day responsibilities and the ability to get away to rest? The availability of these resources can affect how a person deals with things. So these are things we want to keep in mind. If, if people are lacking these things, then we know that the journey is likely going to be harder. The more we can understand the person as an individual, the more that we'll be able to relate effectively. So we come as a guest not to judge, not to assume, but to understand. That's the mindset that we need to bring. But there's something else that we bring. John Calvin, in in his Institutes of the Christian Religions, one of the greatest um, systematic studies of the Bible uh, that's probably ever been written, um, begins with, with two ideas. He said, if you really want to get at the heart of everything, you have to start with two things. You have to know who God is, and you have to know who you are. Knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Okay. And it's good for us to do some introspection to know kind of how we typically tend to do things. Because who we are is always interwoven with what we do. Okay. I tell my kids all the time. Right? You know, I'll tell them to do something. They say, yeah, Dad, I know. I, say, I don't care what you know, I care what you do. Right? Because what you do shows me that you know. Right? What we do matters. God uses us to care for others. We are his tool. And as a Christian, we are always his tool. So as Christian caregivers, we bring two high and holy gifts to those we care for. And our gifts are not a what, but a who. Because we bring Jesus and we bring ourselves. As Christians, we are in Christ and he is in us. So when you show up anywhere, so does Jesus. That's a comforting thought, right? I'm not going into this alone. Jesus is with me. And not the perfect me, but the imperfect me. All of my imperfect feelings, all of my wounds, everything that I am becomes a complete package that Jesus can use. When we talk about Jesus being the incarnation, uh, just breaking that down, carne uh, means flesh. So Jesus is in the flesh. He he came and he, he incarnated with us. He's not sitting somewhere removed. He knows who we are and what we've gone through. So when we're caring for somebody, it's not a two-person relationship, but a three-person relationship. Because you remember in Matthew 25, Jesus said, whatever you have done for the least of one of these brothers of mine, you have done it unto me. Jesus is already there. And the one you are to care for, waiting for your care. And we would not be worthy of such an honor except for the fact that Jesus is also in us. So wherever we go, whatever we do, if we bear the name Christian, just 
a, a Christ-like one. That is who we bring with us. Our lives communicate God to others in the language of flesh and blood, word and touch, and most importantly, listening. The, in the book, it tells of a story of a, a, a man who was going through some kind of treatment. He was in the hospital. He was alone at night. He was cold. And, and one of the nurses had just gotten off her shift, but she brought him a blanket, and she just sat with him through the night holding his hand. And in the morning, he said to her, he said, you were Jesus to me. Just the presence of being there. Jesus is a powerfully active and present participant as we relate to others. If you've ever been a part of this on either side of the caring relationship, you'll know that things happen and people feel things that you look at, that was, that was Jesus, that was nothing I did. I wasn't even aware of that. But Jesus is working as we do this. Where am I? In 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, he writes, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Did you catch that? No one has ever seen God, but if we love God, his love abides in us. So how do we show people who God is? By showing them his love manifest in us. It's not only your love that hurting people experience, but it's God's love expressed through us. Because if you've ever known somebody who's gone through a prolonged period of suffering, it's very common for people to feel like God has abandoned them. But if they have someone who is walking through that with them, feeling God's love through us can make a great difference. Jesus is our greatest resource when we try to relate to hurting people. All of the skill and training will enhance your helpfulness, but all of this is filtered through you, the person you bring to every caring relationship. In Matthew 23, Thirty-seven. Jesus, looking over the city of Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And again, there's that, that double, what, what R.C. Sproul calls a double knock, which indicates a great intimacy, a great love for. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. That idea of, of a hen you know, gathering you know, her, her chicks under her wings, it's that idea of there's danger and I'm going to put myself between you and the danger. It's a, that's a shepherding kind of relationship, a, a, a way of caring that 
we want to stand with people in their hurts. As we do that, we want to be mindful of our own feelings, because our own feelings can be both an asset and a liability. Okay? We can you know, use our feelings to empathize with the one who is suffering. But if that situation hits too close to home, if, it, if it's something that maybe we're going through something similar at the same time, we might get our feelings mixed up with his or her feelings and that boundary between the caregiver and the care receiver can, can start to blur and that, that's not what we want. So again, knowing ourselves right, and knowing you know, how we are doing in our own lives can help us understand how effective we may be able to be or if we need to you know, create some intentional boundaries so that we don't blur those lines where we shouldn't. Okay. Feelings of anxiety and helplessness are common to almost everybody. I have them all the time. Right, because I'm human. I still think this is about me. until I get in there and I realize Jesus says, no, it's not about you. I've, you're just the vehicle. I'm doing the work. Let me do it. It'll, it'll, it'll turn out a lot better. <laughs> right? But going in, I keep thinking it's about me. And so that anxiety meter starts to peg. That I have no idea what I'm going to do in this situation. You know, those thoughts start coming out. And Jesus said, I didn't ask you to do anything, but show up. Anxiety can be a good motivator, but it can also tempt us to try to fix the person so that we feel better. Because right? I don't want to feel anxious. And so the best way for me not to feel anxious is for you to feel better. So I'm going to try to get you better as quick as I can. That's not generally helpful for the other person. We will have a lot of fear in what we do. We'll think, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing. Get over that one, because you will. It just, it's going to happen. You know, and like we said you know, a couple weeks ago, you've got to learn to give yourself some grace and give grace to others. We may fear that getting too close may actually cause us to hurt too. And, and maybe it will. I mean, I was, I was taking a walk down in the cemetery earlier today, and tombstones tell stories too. And I don't know if... if if any of you here know, know the family that I'm talking about, but I noticed two tombstones next to each other. And as I looked at the dates, it was tombstones of two children from the same family. A boy who lived to be about 11. And then a year after he died, a brother was born who lived only to about the age of five in the same family. And I just sat there and looked at it in disbelief. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. The one family would have to go through. I was like, I don't even know who they are, but I, I was hurting for them. This was back, I think, in the, in the 30s and 40s. And I was hurting for that family. Just, and I was like, this is 80 years ago this happened. We fear coming face to face with our own mortality. But we can use these feelings to our benefit. Okay. Again, that's empathy, to feel with 
somebody to feel what they're feeling. We can use anxious feelings to bring God into the picture. Prayer is the antidote to, hum to the human tendency to concentrate on ourselves rather than the feelings of others. So when, when we feel anxious, our mind needs to think, I need to, I need to give this to God. So if you're with somebody, you're feeling anxious, you don't know what to say, It's a great thing to say. You know what? I don't know what to say right now, but can I just pray for you? And ask God to help us? It's a powerful thing. To be a wounded caregiver is actually okay. If you want to read more about this idea of just understanding the depths of human relationships and caring for people, Henry Nowen is just, the dude's like a, a, a genius on this stuff. And he, he wouldn't like me saying that. He's still alive. Um, but he has written so much on this, and his stuff is just so insightful and helpful. Um, I, I read a story. Uh, he was friends with, with uh, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And, and apparently when, when Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood first came out, Fred Rogers took a lot of heat from people over his work with children, um, thinking, that, thinking the worst about him in this being inappropriate. I mean, people were writing some pretty bad stuff about him. And he, he wrote to Henry now, and, and he, you know, he, he talked to him about this. And, and Henry said, I, I, said, I can't imagine what you're, what you're going through. He said, this is, this is horrible. He said, but I'm, I'm committed to pray for you. And just, you know, God knows the truth. I know the truth. And, and you just keep doing what you're doing. But uh, Henry now says, the caring relationship is a deep human encounter in which a man is willing to put his own faith and doubt, his own hope and despair, his own light and darkness at the disposal of others who want to find a way through their confusion and touch the solid core of life. When we let people in, Something in us changes, and it's usually for the better. According to Henry Nouwen, compassion is the core element of caregiving, and it's central for relating. So to the extent we are in touch with the depths of ourselves, we will bring the valuable equity of caring to suffering individuals. If we haven't learned how really to care for ourselves and show compassion to ourselves, it will affect how well we can show compassion and empathy to, to others. Because what you and the suffering person share is the human condition. We've all been through stuff. Right? And that, those experiences are valuable. Right? Not that as a caregiver we want to dump those experiences on the other person, but we use those for our benefit to relate to what the other person is feeling. We are more similar than we are different. And we remember as we go through the season of Lent that Jesus also shared the very same human condition which is the basis for Christian fellowship at its deepest level. So we rely on the power of presence. People may not remember what you said, 
but they will remember your presence. When I was in North Carolina, I got a, the call that nobody wants to get early on a Saturday morning. A young lady in our church called and she said, Ma, Mama and Keith were in a car accident last night. She said, they're in Johnson City, we're heading there now. I said, I'll meet you there. I didn't even know where Johnson City was. Turns out it's in Tennessee. So for three and a half hours, I'm just following my GPS. And of course, it's taking me the direct route over the mountains, not you know, the circuitous route along the interstates. And I went there, and I, I beat the family there. I don't know how I did that. But, um, I met with the family, and for several days of that week, I would make the trip up there, and I would just sit in these ICU rooms. They were, Johnson City is a magnificent medical facility. It's one of the best trauma facilities probably in the country. And they had different wings for different things in, in their ICU. Unit. So the woman was in one wing and, and the, the man was in the other wing. And I would just kind of move from room to room. And if people would come in, I would just, I would tell them what I knew and just sit back down. And a year or two later when everybody was back home, um, Keith, the guy, would say to me, he said, you know, he said every once in a while I'd open up my eyes, and he was intubated and had a whole bunch of things going on. He said, I'd open up my eyes, and I'd just look over, and he said, you were sitting there. He said, I don't remember if you said anything, but he said, I knew you were there. He said, that meant a lot. I said, I was just sitting there praying. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was in the car. I was planning. I was like, I haven't done that many funerals, and now I'm probably going to have to do a double one. When they were discharged from the hospital, one of the ER docs who was on duty that night, he wasn't treating them, but he, was, he saw them come in late at night. They were both life flighted in. And he said, I like to acknowledge a miracle when I see it, because he said, when I saw you two, when you came in, he said, I didn't think you were going to be there in the morning. Incarnation. When we incarnate with somebody else, when we're in the presence of somebody else, it makes God seem near rather than far away. And you think, how can that be true about me? Well, it's because Christ is in us. Your presence is worth more than words. It's the gift of yourself and the gift of God. And that's what makes caring for people effective. That's what allows us, when we go to these places and talk to people about their tattoos, and do so in a way that is gentle and respectful that you can see these big burly guys with their leather jackets and you know grizzled face start to shed a tear because somebody's actually willing to talk about and listen to their groanings that may not be audible but they're screaming all over their skin. And so we learn to listen. And to incarnate and just be a presence with them. I'm sure there's guys all over the country right now saying, you know, there's these weird people down there that came up and started asking me about their dad. But they sat and listened. When we were in Sturgis at the end of the, about at the end of the week or so, we were there. There were guys who actually came to our booth and they looked at us and said, this is the best thing 
that's here. He said, thank you for doing this. The power of the presence, just being with people, helps us. And it's the power of the presence that we, we think about Jesus being with us and we think about where we long to be with him. So as we close tonight, I'll ask that, would you stand with us? We're going to sing uh, another one of my favorite little songs, but it's an easy one uh, to pick up. I'll ask uh, Rose and Julia to come up. It's called On Jordan's Stormy Banks, I Stand. There's a uh, little bit of an echo part on the chorus, but I'm sure you'll, you'll figure it out. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen. Thanks for coming tonight.